this is what we do to the hard drives after we're done with them. And they had, you know, like, crush them, shred <laughs> yeah. them, yeah. incinerate them. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, whoa. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call the technological convergence. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today we will be talking about how to reduce the environmental impact of the technology we use. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED 47. Now, this is one of those topics that I didn't know uh, a whole lot about before I decided to make an episode about this. So I'm very excited that we have several different uh, guests coming on this episode to talk about individual little pieces of the puzzle that go into uh, making sure that our technology is environmentally friendly. Um, and I'll introduce them as we get to them. A lot of those conversations went in um, directions that are more technical, more detailed than uh, what I needed for this episode. But uh, if you are interested in hearing more from any of these guests, you are in luck. I uh, included all of the the full interviews uh, in the French for this episode, which can be found at thenexus.tv slash tf. 564. Or you can find a link to it in the show notes. And of course, being that there are so many different pieces at play here, um, some of the things that we're going to talk about here in this episode conflict with each other. So as you're learning all of this and deciding how to incorporate it into your own life, uh, just keep keep all of the different aspects in mind and, uh, you know, try to find a good balance for your own life. Now, I'm sure everybody has heard the age-old advice of reduce, reuse, recycle. And it's very important to remember that we need to do those three things in that order. Reduce is the most important, and then reuse, and then recycle. But does that apply very well to technology? Well, it does, but in very particular ways. So. Let's go through each of those three items and, uh, and see what we can do with our uh, personal electronics and things like that. So, reducing. This applies to electronics in a few different ways. Um, mainly, reducing the number of electronic devices that you are buying, uh, and then also reducing the amount of energy that those devices use. So first, it's definitely important to think critically about the devices that you're buying. Do you really need what they are providing? Um, or is this you know, a, a luxury, a convenience that isn't going to impact your life all that much? So yeah, just getting off of this treadmill of constantly needing to buy the new thing uh, and having all this stuff in our lives uh, is a very, very important part of reducing our environmental impact. This also ties into the concept of degrowth, which is a topic that warrants its own episode, so we'll come back to that uh, in a few months in a different episode of The Extra Dimension. Second, we want to make sure that we are using our devices for as long as possible so that we don't have to buy a brand new one uh, right away, right? So it's definitely a good idea before you buy an item to, you know, check in and see what, what are we expecting to happen in the, in the near future, you know, with, regarding the manufacturer who is making your device, right? Are they expected to be releasing a new version of the product that you are about to buy? Might not be the best time to buy it, right? Because then your device will uh, be supported for not as long. And also, um, I mean, it's just you won't want to have it for as long if there is uh, a new or better version that, you know, comes out at around the same time. For example, St. Paul Public Schools, in their infinite wisdom, uh, switched all of the teachers over to using uh, MacBook Airs uh, that were released in 2017, um, and they bought them all about a month before uh, Apple <laughs> refreshed the 
MacBook Air line, uh, and so now I am stuck with a MacBook that uh, does not have USB Type-C, and it makes me very sad. Purchasing devices with modular parts is definitely a good idea, and we will talk more about that in the reuse section where we're going to go over uh, a lot more on how to repair devices. But you can also modularize not just your devices themselves, but also your entire setup. So for example, uh, instead of getting a smart TV that um, you know depends on a particular online service to to run to you know get all of the content that you want to display on it um, maybe get just a normal tv and then plug in whatever streaming device has the content platforms that you want uh, and and that way you won't have to you won't feel the need to replace your entire tv if you know for example netflix decides not to partner with Vizio anymore, and then you can't stream that on your Vizio TV. Um, if you segment out those different parts of, of the system, um, then the television will last you much longer because all it's doing is displaying whatever content is sent to it, and you would only need to uh, worry about like replacing whatever small streaming device uh, you have plugged into your TV. Getting devices that will have software support for a long, long time is a very good strategy. Um, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, those are all great operating systems that have really long support windows. Um, Chrome OS devices, I recently found out, are only supported for six and a half years, um, but luckily it is not too challenging to replace Chrome OS on one of those devices with a full Linux build or with a community supported version of Chromium OS. For mobile devices, uh, Apple has been supporting their phones for around six years. Um, on the Android side, it really depends on what device manufacturer you get a phone from. Uh, some are much better than others, um, but the, the longest uh, running support that I am aware of is the uh, Pixel devices from Google have like three or four years of software support. However, the open nature of the Android operating system means that uh, even if the company that made the phone is not uh, releasing software updates for it anymore, you may be able to find a community-run ROM uh, to install on it instead of the uh, operating system that came with the phone. One of the most popular third-party ROMs uh, out there is Lineage OS, and I was lucky enough to get to sit down with a couple of members of the Lineage OS team to chat about it. Well, my name is Luca, and uh, I'm uh, the director of the Lineage. I'm one of the nine directors. And I mainly work on platform, and uh, I also uh, maintain a few devices. Uh, Nolan Johnson. So I'm a device maintainer that does uh, developer relations and some public relations as well. Why do third-party ROMs exist in the first place? What's the uh, motivation for the community to create something like this? Um, the two I can think of are uh, extension of security updates uh, beyond the manufacturer's um, end-of-life date. Um, and then I would say secondarily, the customization features that can be added aftermarket that might not pass Google's TTS. Um, a super popular one back in the day was uh, saving your photographs to an external SD card, because I know that there was some uh, some talk back in the day about that not passing Google's CTS, but on a third party ROM, you could do that. So what are the, what are the challenges with uh, making and maintaining a third party ROM? The hardest part is to have some an OEM that allows us to customize our device. So first of all, we need an unlinkable uh, bootloader that allows us to flash unsecured the, uh, images. It's uh, a mix and match with uh, what the OEM provides to you and what the, the Google itself, is, itself provides. And uh, it ends up with a mix of uh, what's already open source with what uh, isn't open source and it's uh, pr uh, proprietary. 
So the, the real job is to get the, the perfect balance between them so that you can have uh, something usable. My answer to the hardest part, most interesting parts for me is uh, developer relations. Uh, so incoming developers that want their device officially supported. Um, I do a lot of device tree kernel and proprietary blobs review for incoming developers that are submitting unofficial ROMs. One of the biggest things I run into is, you know, I, you know, we say, okay, we do it this way and they go, well, this works fine. And you go, well, that's not the standard we set. That's not what we, you know, expect, you know, expected behavior. What, what things should a, a consumer be looking for if they want to have a device that, that is going to be supported for the longest term possible? Getting an OEM that is known for having good uh, developer relations and uh, good developer support. Uh, for example, OnePlus is uh, always go- doing a great job, but uh, and we think they keep doing it, but uh, maybe next year they change something. And that's uh, hard to say if uh, we can uh, still support the same device. Look at Huawei. I mean, this last year we had Luke and Luca both were doing great work on Huawei devices. And then thanks to one corporate decision to stop allowing unlockable bootloaders, we now can't work on them. Mm. Like, it's pretty much that simple. So, you know, it, it's really, uh, you know, people bought those devices because at the time they're fully supported. And the problem being that we just can't guarantee that everything's going to stay the same, you know? While we were chatting, the topic of dynamic system updates came up as well. Dynamic system updates is an upcoming feature of Android 10 that works kind of like dual booting an operating system on a desktop computer. Um, So basically you can have two different versions of Android uh, installed onto different partitions uh, on a phone and uh, switch between them at will. With DSU, again, if they do it right, which I am praying they do, it would mean that you'd be able to enroll, like, say, Lineage's key in your Pixel. If it if it's implemented the right way, you'd be able to just to boot a Lineage ROM for your device and have a virtual partition so that, like, you know, the way Google would do that is it's not a security issue for us because it's don't it's almost as if it's a VM. It's it's not it's not taking the performance that a VM is, but from a security standpoint, it's similarly segmented. So Google cares less about, oh, yeah, they can have fun in that little container because they can't do anything outside of it. Now, there are some efforts to make a fully open Linux phone, um, and this uh, bypasses the challenge that faces Android ROM communities like Lineage OS, uh, where they have to rely on binary blobs from the manufacturers in order to get Android running on them. But these efforts to come out with a fully Linux phone are hindered by the fact that most mobile hardware component manufacturers won't provide open drivers and things like that. Um, So they uh, are limited in the types of hardware that they can put in the phone, um, which uh, puts them at a huge disadvantage to the larger corporations that are making more mainstream devices. And lastly, it's a very good idea to take care of your devices. Um, In the physical sense, of course, you know, if we're talking about a phone, you can put a case on your phone. Um, Choose a case that is appropriate to how clumsy you are with it, right? Um, You know, my brother has like a full OtterBox case on his uh, gigantic Pixel XL. Um, I don't drop my phone nearly so often, so I'm able to get away with just a a slim uh, plastic case that um, protects the back and sides of the phone. Battery health is very important uh, because the battery is typically one of the first components of a device that, uh, you know, really starts to deteriorate. Rechargeable lithium-ion batteries that we typically use in our electronic devices uh, deteriorate mostly due to repeated cycles of being discharged and recharged. So if you can limit the number of times that you fully recharge your device, that helps a lot. When recharging your device, if you unplug it after it gets to about 80%, um, that reduces the amount of wear that uh, is put on the battery itself. And, uh, and so then your, your battery will have a much, much longer lifetime. I'm a fan of buying multi-purpose devices instead of buying individual, like, 
specific gadgets for each particular thing that you want them to do. Um, that reduces the number of devices that you need to buy. And if there's a particular item that you use very infrequently, um, so like in my household, a printer, right? We very occasionally need to print things off, but not very often. Um, you might not even need to own one at all. So I usually just go down to the library, the local public library, and use their printer, um, which is fairly cheap. Or let's be honest, I have a printer in my classroom at work that I'm able to use uh, sometimes for personal things as well. When you do buy a device, it can be useful to uh, consider was it manufactured uh, in a sustainable manner? Um, most of the companies that are out there, most of the major manufacturers have some sort of environmental statement that they've made about uh, you know reducing the impact of the devices that they are making. Um, but not all of them walk the walk that they're talking. A company that does seem very, very serious about this topic is Fairphone, who um, go to great lengths to make sure that like their entire um, supply chain and manufacturing process is using uh, sustainable materials. Um, and they have also made some very repairable phones, so we'll talk more about that when we get to the reuse section. And then the final point in the reduce section is uh, we want to reduce our energy consumption. Um, one of the easiest ways to do this is to buy products that are Energy Star certified. Um, that's a certification that is given by the EPA. So that is definitely a trustworthy source. But then there are some other little tricks that you can also do. Um, so whatever task you are doing at a particular time, um, try to use like the smallest, lowest powered device that you can get away with for that particular job. For example, if I am just uh, streaming some video on my TV, um, a Chromecast will use a lot less energy than like the desktop that I have plugged into my television. Most devices, of course, have power saving modes, so make sure that you uh, have those turned on and allow your devices to go to sleep um, if, if, uh, if that isn't going to impact your usage of them in any way. Most operating systems these days have dark modes where they will turn uh, large portions of the user interface to uh, either a black or a dark gray or something like that. Um, and those, especially if you have a device that has like an AMOLED display, um, those will allow the screen to use a lot less power. I also like it because it's easier on the eyes. Something that a lot of people don't often think about is the fact that whenever we are loading content from a server, um, the, of course, server has to use some energy to load that content and send it to us, but also each of the routers in between that our packets, uh, you know, travel through, those all have to use power to send those signals as well. So, for content that you're going to be using often, so for example, if you've got like uh, a favorite playlist of music that you listen to a lot, um, downloading that onto your local device so that it doesn't have to load those files every single time that you are listening to it, um, that can save a lot of power as well. And if you are in a position where you're somebody who is running a server, um, chances are it's probably a better idea for energy usage to rent a virtual server in an existing data center rather than running your own hardware, um, unless you're operating at like a very large scale. But that is something that you would really want to evaluate for yourself. Now, consuming media in a digital format certainly takes up less energy, fewer resources than consuming it in a physical medium, right? So getting an ebook instead of a uh, paper book is uh, definitely more efficient um, from the environmental impact perspective. But I do worry about the way that, like, Consuming everything digitally uh, has really resulted in us just consuming way, way, way more 
uh, media than we did before. And uh, so I, I do kind of worry that we might be using more energy than before just through the sheer volume of stuff that we are consuming. But I, I don't have like concrete numbers for you uh, on, on that issue. So if anybody does know that if there's research out there on that topic, uh, please let me know. Now, something that I hear a lot of people worrying about is uh, this concept of vampire power, um, which is, you know, the concept that, uh, okay, I have my phone charger that uh, I plugged into the wall and I plug my phone into it and it charges. But after I've unplugged my phone, um, you know, a lot of people talk about how that brick is still drawing some power uh, from, from the wall. That kind of thing isn't a huge concern, but if you want to check for yourself, the thing to look for is how hot is that device? Um, so whenever, whenever an electronic device is drawing electricity, um, that electricity, that energy is either going to be converted into heat uh, or light or some other you know, energy that we can detect. Um, and so for, for items like uh, bricks, right, that are converting alternating current to direct current, those are only going to be uh, generating heat. So if you put your hand on a brick that is plugged into the wall and it is not warm to the touch, then it is using less than three cents worth of power uh, per year. So that really is not something that you need to worry about too much. But if you do have uh, a device uh, that is um, drawing a little bit of power, a little bit more than, than three cents per year uh, when it's plugged in, um, you can always use a power strip and uh, just, you know, like cut the power to that device whenever you don't really need to be using it. Um, so here on my desk, for example, I have my uh, soundboard, my speakers, and... Um, my shredder and my, my laptop charger are all plugged into a separate uh, power strip than my main desktop and, you know, the, the devices that I want to have on all the time. Um, and so I can just cut power to my soundboard and other things like that um, whenever I'm not using them. Which is definitely good because I have noticed that my soundboard gets pretty warm uh, even when I am not actively using it. All right, let's move on to reuse. So the number one thing that you can do to keep a device going for a really long time is make sure that it is something that you will be able to repair, right? You don't want to have to throw something away just because one individual little component is broken on it. And here to talk about the repairability of devices, uh, we have Taylor from iFixit. My name is Taylor Dixon. I am a tech writer slash teardown engineer at iFixit. iFixit.com has a ton of resources. Uh, what it is, it's a wiki site that um, is built to be like a, an all-encompassing repair manual. And so anybody can go on and make a guide for how to fix their car or how to fix their phone. Um <clears throat> And yeah, it's also a forum for asking repair questions. And also iFixit.com is home to our parts store. So we sell parts for different phones or other devices. We also sell tools that uh, do pretty well. It is ideally an all-in-one repair stop. Everything you could need to repair your device from the parts to the information, you can find it, I fix it. We care that a device is user repairable because sometimes it is easier to send it back to the manufacturer, but there are many, many other times where the manufacturer has the highest price or the manufacturer does not live close to you. Um, so you, you would have to send your device away for, you know, who knows how long as opposed to walking down the street and having it repaired. Um, one, one comparison we like to make is um, to cars. So imagine if you always had to take your car back to the dealership to get it fixed. 
everyone kind of knows that the dealership charges more than your local mechanic. And the same kind of applies to fixing your phone or other electronics. Oftentimes, the manufacturer can just kind of set whatever price they want, whereas your local fixer can kind of work for cheaper. When you fix something yourself and you don't take it to the manufacturer, you kind of, you develop a relationship with it. As weird as that sounds, you, you get to know it and it, it really does kind of enhance your ownership of that thing in a really cool way. It depends obviously from device to device, kind of what makes it repairable and what things, what, what considerations we give, I guess. Like we, we don't expect tiny earbuds to be as repairable as a giant laptop, let's say. And so we, we try to be fair with our score, but ultimately like, it's really hard to put all this information into a 10 point scale. So, um, but really what we look for the most is that you can put the device back together cleanly without it being destroyed or modeled too much. Um, and then after that, it's um, disposable things like batteries that we really want to be able to access. And then any other failure prone part or like a screen or like something that's used often like a headphone jack. Uh, so we want to make sure those are swappable or I mean even not swappable it's just fixable you know and then there are always trade-offs like durability versus repairability where you kind of or manufacturers will make something more durable and so we want to give them credit for that but sometimes that hinders the repairability and so it's kind of a tightrope that we and manufacturers walk when we make these scores and they make the devices. Right. So I'm, I, I imagine that that is a lot of things like uh, dust ingress and like waterproofness. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Adhesives are exactly what I'm talking about when I, when I mentioned durability and repairability trade-offs um, because adhesive, like you said, is mostly used for ingress protection, at least for some devices, uh, like the AirPods, which are totally unrepairable, are basically just like dipped in adhesive and you can't do anything about it. <laughs> um, but phones, most phones use adhesive now. And so you just kind of have to adapt and learn to work around it. Uh, but then there are some, even some laptop manufacturers that are using a lot of adhesive, like the newer MacBook Pros, and that can just be a pain like the the smaller you get with these devices like the more unfeasible it is to to want all of the different components to be nice and modular you know yeah exactly um, like i wouldn't like i i expect that if i want to replace my graphics card in my desktop you know i can just take one out and put the next one in but mm -hmm. that's i would definitely not expect that of my phone or even of my laptop yeah and so those, those are all kind of just uh, concessions that you make as devices get smaller, but there are things that can or should be replaceable no matter how small the device is, like the battery. Uh, like it is genuinely difficult to find a pair of wireless earbuds that you can replace the battery in, but that battery is for sure going to die. So in two or three years, you know, those headphones are just dead and you have to use them with a cable or just throw them in a landfill, which is exactly what we're trying to prevent. So many of these things have to be manufactured, have to be designed to fit within a particular chassis. Yeah. Uh, unique, bespoke battery <laughs> shapes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, even, even the Fairphone, which got uh, a 10 out of 10 repairability score from iFixit, like all of the components in there I think are still components that are unique to the Fairphone. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Um, so we're not we're not living in in the truly modular smartphone world. We um, are not. Which... Unfortunately, <laughs> Google's Project Aura died. So yeah, that would have been amazing. 
That would have been amazing. It, I I really wonder how that would have changed the landscape of phones. You know, that would have been such an interesting future to live in. Mm -hmm. This also ties into the like right to repair movement. So like, what what is what is this movement? Who's involved in it, and what what are its goals? So the right to repair movement is it when you ask who is involved. There are a couple answers. One, the first answer is everyone is involved. Uh, um, at least everyone who cares about owning their devices, I guess. Um, the second answer to who is involved is a bunch of people. Um, there are a couple corporations like iFixit or companies, I guess, not corporations. Um, and then we have... There is a list on repair.org, which is the uh, like hub website for all repair, right to repair information. Um, and you can kind of scroll through and see every single person who is involved or has donated to the campaign. Um, so yeah, check that out and check repair.org out for sure. Uh, the second part of your question, which is what is the movement? is well the answer is the uh, repair right to repair movement is a movement trying to enact legislature that will guarantee property rights and guarantee equal access to parts and repair information so just like your car we want the repair information for all electronic devices to be available to everyone or at least you know, repair shops so that you don't have to go back to the manufacturer. And ideally, this bill, should it pass somewhere, would also include uh, parts availability because, you know, a lot of what we do is we work with company, foreign companies who make, you know, knockoff sounds bad, but they're, they're kind of knockoff parts we we can't get parts straight from apple or straight from google third party alternatives exactly yeah that's that's a great term <laughs> and these parts are actually are surprisingly good most of the time um but it would be just amazing if we could just go to apple and say hey we need 300 iphone screens for next week can you send those to us um but that's just not possible Right. And, and that still would give like Apple just a monopoly on like manufacturing all of the replacement parts. Um, yeah, for sure. That's true. I guess if there's one one last thing that I can say, I would say, don't be afraid to fix something yourself. Uh, fixing things is such a black box to people. People feel like their phone or their laptop is the magical wonder and i mean they are magical wonders let's be honest technology is amazing uh but it works in a specific way because it has to work in a specific way scientifically and all you need to do is look up a guide maybe on ifixit.com and figure out how to open it and you can yes you can seriously fix your device so go for it so as you can see, it's not just about buying devices that are repairable by themselves, but also we need to support uh, organizations like the Right to Repair movement um, as, as they try to encourage, you know, laws that actually will allow us to continue to be able to repair the devices that we own. Uh, and it's also important to keep companies accountable uh, to reducing barriers to repairing devices, right? Making sure that they know that, uh, that this is a feature that we want in our devices and we won't buy them if they are not repairable, that can go a long way. Now, sometimes it doesn't really matter what we get a company to care about because sometimes companies go under they go out of business they get sold whatever um one such company that uh, i was really really bummed didn't make it uh was pebble uh, because i had bought a pebble smartwatch and uh, and i really really liked it and i wanted to continue using it but then pebble was bought by uh fitbit and 
the most likely scenario was that uh, the software, the servers that my watch depended on to, for most of its functionality were going to be going away. Luckily, though, a community sprang up uh, around the idea of continuing to uh, keep these pebbles alive, uh, and they called themselves the Rebel Alliance. And uh, I have I shot JR here from the Rebel Alliance to talk about uh, that whole journey. So I go by I shot JR. Um, the title I typically use for Rebel stuff is Lead Emoji Sprinkler, um, <laughs> because a lot of what I do is just uh, jumping in and out of different projects and uh, indicating my excitement with uh, rocket and heart emojis and things like that. I um, liaise with Fitbit and other partners to try and get things done that we need done. But yeah, I mostly kind of aggregate um, project statuses and turn them into blog posts and um, keep people excited, um, try and inject a little bit of organization when possible and get my hands dirty when needed. So yeah, let's uh, let's rewind the clock a little bit here and talk about kind of the a brief history of, of Pebble itself. Um, I don't know how far back you want to go, but um, basically uh, Eric Michikovsky, um was riding around on a bike and just kind of had the idea that he would like something to get his notifications and control his music on. And he created a prototype called the Watch Duino, which is an Arduino-based uh, PCB that he made with a couple of buttons and a little battery and a Nokia screen on it. And it could, you know, receive text, um, display music um, tracks, and uh, obviously tell the time because it is a watch. Um, from there, I believe the next evolution was the Alert to Impulse, which was uh, kind of a niche product for BlackBerry users back when BlackBerry was a bit more popular. Um, and they eventually brought it to Android, I think. Um, but then they were accepted into Y Combinator and uh, launched that first Kickstarter, which was, you know, at the time, the biggest Kickstarter ever for the what we now refer to as the OG Pebble. And, uh, you know, I think most people know the story from there, but um, they kept doing more Kickstarters for the Pebble Time and then the Pebble 2 and Core and um, Time 2. And uh, that was kind of the genesis of the, the hardware. One thing that I had totally forgotten about until my interview with iShot JR is the concept of smart straps, which was a hardware platform that Pebble kind of introduced that allowed any other hardware developers to make their own devices that could then plug directly into the Pebble watches and uh, interact with data in whatever way they wanted to. That really impressed me when when they announced like the whole smart strap yeah. concept. I was like, wow, okay, they're not just making like a software platform. This is like you know a hardware platform that is like totally open and interoperable. Uh, yeah. That's it, and that's like almost unheard of. Yeah, I mean, I lost my mind when they announced that <laughs> the kick started because uh, all the time that I wasn't spending doing Pebble stuff, I was spending, you know hardware hacking on Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and stuff like that. So combining those things in one place on my wrist was just like the ultimate thing. So what do you think would have happened to like Pebble hardware if like the community hadn't formed Rebel and, you know, gotten servers up and running and, and software support and whatnot? Yeah, well, I mean, so we're pretty lucky um, because of the way Pebble architected things they were pretty open and forward-thinking i mean we could have been luckier for example if they'd have open sourced their firmware that would have been great um it would save us a lot of work but things like being able to sideload apps and uh you know that kind of stuff makes it way easier for us so that said though i mean without rebel um pebbles would still be pretty usable You'd be able to get notifications. Um, you'd be able to slide load apps, like I mentioned. Uh, you'd be able to get some timeline notifications if you added something to your calendar, mm. uh, for example, but not the real timeline, which is something we added. So then the things you wouldn't get um, that we do provide through uh, RWS are you know, the app store, uh, dictation, uh, timeline. Weather. So, weather, yeah, absolutely. Um, so Fitbit. There was actually, in the first first days or weeks when 
um, we heard the announcement and we just started reverse engineering everything. Um, one of the things that we attacked early on was the uh, was the apps and uh, the App Store API. And someone figured out pretty quickly that you could actually um, use an alternative boot server and swap out all of the endpoints with your own. And <clears throat> that's basically what's allowed us to do um, Rebel Web Services is instead of all the things that point to Pebble, which don't exist anymore, we just point them to us. Fitbit actually published another version of the app post Pebble that kind of opened stuff up even more, um, both made it easier to um, point to alternative services, like I said, and also if you didn't want to do that, um, skip the need for authentication period. So you could at least use your Pebble app and sideload apps and you know you wouldn't get any of the online stuff. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of give a shout out to Fitbit there because they actually published a new version of the app to help, I mean, us specifically, honestly, as well as um, the Pebble audience in general, which was a really cool thing that they definitely didn't have to do, and we appreciate a lot. It's funny, I was thinking about this, and I mean, there's definitely been hurdles, but everything's been bizarrely surmountable. Like, we've never, I, I don't know if it's just luck or forward thinking from Pebble or what, but Anytime there seemed like something that could be an immense or you know insurmountable challenge, we've always got around it. I think the the bigger challenge has been just kind of like bandwidth and and focus um, rather than anything technical. I mean, when the iOS app left the App Store, that that would have I probably would have been saying that was a, a fatal challenge if it weren't for the fact that we were able to um, have our friends. A Fitbit bring that back but I mean lots of things are very hard replacing the entire firmware is very hard making that ready making it last for anything like the seven to ten days that you know pebble time steel lasts that stuff is hard uh, it's not impossible um, it's mostly about just resources and bandwidth and I feel like we've been so lucky that we really haven't had any fatal problems yet, knock on wood. <laughs> <laughs> Someone uh, I was talking to about this the other day said something like, you're not going to get this same enthusiasm for keeping you know, a Samsung S7 alive. Nobody cares about a Samsung S7. It's a boring slab that got replaced with the S8, whereas the Pebble is a charming thing that's unlike anything else and specifically hasn't been recreated or superseded since according to the people who care about the pebbly aspects of pebble like buttons and always on display so there's a big community out there um, who are all very passionate about pebble and that helps keep us going whether through active participation of those people contributing um, subscriptions or code or even just those people being excited and keeping us excited. And that community is, you know, all thanks to Pebble. They did an amazing job with community building and specifically with developer relations. They did an amazing job. Um, all of their documentation was amazing. Like I mentioned, they had hackathons and the, these rock stars like myself that organized local meetups and they just created an amazing developer community and larger community of people that just love their thing. So the openness helped make it technically possible and the community made it, you know, kind of worthwhile. So it sounds like primarily there are three people who are like full, like, okay, not full time, but like, you know, mainly yeah. involved in, in Rebel. Yeah, I wish, I wish any of us were full time. <laughs> um, everyone is volunteers, except actually, uh, Josh is now kind of not on the payroll, literally, but um, we've actually started using some of our uh, funds to be able to um, accelerate some of the things. Like you may have seen the App Store submission is now a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that was possible um, because we're basically paying him to be able to spend more time on it than he would otherwise. Uh, similar for the timeline, we had a, um, that was a user contribution, but we still had to have someone um, code review and deploy it and stuff. So um, we've actually kind of retained Josh um, as uh, someone to to push forward some of those initiatives. Um, but yes, um, 
Catherine is obviously a huge part of Rebel. Um, she's not super involved um, at the moment, but we kind of tap her when we need to. And obviously she is almost single-handedly responsible for RWS, which is the most important thing we've ever done and just an amazing accomplishment. So she is forever um, our sparkly code princess uh, for contributing that, obviously. And um, yeah, I mean, we might be the three most recognizable names because of the blog posts and things like that and media coverage, but there's, um, I wouldn't even like to try to list all the other people because there's, you know, at least a dozen plus other people who are involved in firmware development, app store development. Um, something which probably never gets mentioned, so I'm going to mention it is uh, sort of not exactly customer service, but um, support. Um, I Like I said, I handle anything to do with payments, um, and Josh helps on that too, but um, there's lots of people just, you know, how do I switch to Rebel? And we have a bunch of people on the Discord that help out with that, and so I just want to big them up real quick because I doubt that anybody thinks much of them when they're thinking about Rebel, but they are a huge part of what we do. Since the beginning, since those early reverse engineering days, we've always had the kind of same list of uh, things that need to be solved. Uh, one of them is RWS, which Catherine, you know, did the bulk of uh, before our timeline, but there's still some little things out there, like the App Store submissions, which is the thing that just went live. Before then, um, apps and watch faces were kind of set in stone. There was no way to update them, and now we can actually update them. So the first new Pebble app has been published, and developers who want to publish new apps or watch faces or update their existing ones can now do so. One thing that's always been there um, but just hasn't received a lot of attention is the mobile apps. Uh, with RWS, we had a firm deadline. It was we had to do it before Fitbit turned the servers off. With the mobile apps, there's not such a firm deadline. It's more uh, as the mobile OSs continue to evolve, they break things in the apps. It's like shocking that the apps work at all since they haven't been <laughs> updated in so long but they do and there's workarounds for some of the things that don't work um maybe ios 14 will come out and nothing will work at all and that'll be a new scramble to create that app but um that's just not been anything that's received a lot of attention same thing on android i mean it got removed from the play store because of their new um security policy, but it can be sideloaded easily, so there's really no reason to spend a lot of resources on that. And then, obviously, uh, the firmware is another big thing. That's uh, something we have to do ourselves from scratch. That's something we've been working on pretty much since the beginning, creating a new free RTOS-based operating system that behaves like Pebbles and is compatible with the existing API so that uh, all of our apps that people have written can just be recompiled and will work. So the other part is hardware, which goes kind of in parallel with firmware. We need new firmware to replace um, Pebbles because we don't have the source code, so we have to recreate it from scratch. Um, again, there's no super firm uh, deadline there like there was with RWS, as much as it's just something that's interesting for people to hack on, and a lot of people like to be involved in working on it because it's fun. But where there is a need for it is on the hardware side, the Pebble 2s are failing because of their button defect. Um, even Pebble Times and Pebble Time Steel's buttons are getting older and their batteries are getting older and their gaskets are getting older and they're not waterproof anymore. So device, the number of devices out there is only ever shrinking. It's never getting bigger at the moment. And uh, the OGs, uh, a lot of those are still kicking somehow, which is just amazing. And some of them have uh, not the original Kickstarters, but uh, a, a later release of those actually came with screws on the back. So they're easy, to, easy. They are possible to swap batteries on things like that. But hardware is something we're definitely thinking about. And we have a couple of different avenues that we're um, pursuing on that. And we've got a couple different prototypes that we're playing with, basically getting firmware done and really getting some new hardware somehow um, to run that new firmware, just since nobody else seems interested in making anything Pebble-esque. It's kind of the next thing. 
a message I'd, I'd like to share if I can is just people who are aware of Pebble and who uh, love Pebble or care about keeping things like Pebble alive. I'd love to see those people get involved, um, whether as just, you know, posting things on Reddit to show your excitement about Rebel so that we know it's worth working on or retweeting our tweets or, you know, if you are a developer, we are always looking for more developers and more bandwidth because that's kind of our biggest problem right now is just bandwidth. We have a lot of people who are very excited, but as an open source software with no, we're not paying people to complete a job, so people are welcome to kind of fade out whenever they want. It's a lot of fun to work on this stuff, so I'm going to do a blog post sometime soon um, along the lines of sort of help wanted where I let people know how they can contribute. It's not just developers. We have all kinds of uh, slots that need filling, and that's a continual thing. I don't know that we'll ever have enough bandwidth. So anyone who is interested in helping keep Pebbles alive or just hacking on a cool open source harbor project, if you're not familiar with Pebble, it would be really great if you could uh, get in touch with us on uh, Twitter or Reddit or any of the many social media. Now, with just a little imagination, we can also find some new uses for old devices that we might have lying around. Um, in particular, uh, I found a, an article that uh, has some ideas for things that you could do with an old phone or tablet. Um, they've got ideas like you can use it as a remote control for your desktop or TV. You could set it up in the corner of a room as a security camera. Um, or, or as a digital photo frame. Um, you could use it as a dedicated e-reader. That's pretty much what I use my NVIDIA Shield tablet these days. Um, it just sits by my bedside, and uh, whenever I you know, want to relax and read some articles or comics or whatever, uh, that's what I use because it's just nicer to read on a larger screen than my phone. I have also joked about the possibility, since the Shield tablet has magnets in it, uh, that I could stick it onto the fridge to make our uh, regular fridge into a smart fridge. But I don't think that that's really, uh, that's, that's not really what that means. But as you're trying to come up with new uses for your old devices, it is important to really be honest with yourself. If the device isn't really getting much use, then don't hold on to it just because you feel like you have to get some use out of it, right? Um, in that case, it's probably best to either sell it to somebody else who will use it more um, or to recycle it. Um, both of those options will kind of keep that material circulating, right? It'll keep us from having to manufacture even more devices. And that brings us nicely to recycling our electronics. This is definitely the part of the process that I knew the least about going into this episode, um, but I was lucky enough to get to tour two different recycling facilities, um, the Washington County Environmental Center and uh, Tech Dump here in St. Paul. So I'm Adam Frederick. I'm the program coordinator here at the Washington County Environmental Center in Woodbury, Minnesota. Uh, we're open to residents of Washington County, of course, and then we have a reciprocal use agreement with all residents of the metropolitan counties. My name is Amanda LaGrange, and I have the honor of being the CEO of Tech Dump. Quick note about these two interviews. I did interview Adam and Amanda at separate times in different places, but uh, I will be splicing together their answers here in this episode because uh, they had a lot to do with each other. So yeah, I understand that like it's illegal to throw electronics away just in the general trash. Mm -hmm. um, why is that? Yes, so our electronic devices contain what can become hazardous waste if exposed to water. So inside of a computer, there's a wonderful circuit board that to the world looks like a very fancy green board with things on it. Um, but to those that are kind of deep into the space, we know that there's actually lead in the board. And so if that were to get exposed to water in a landfill or perhaps be incinerated, which is another route mm -hmm. that some of our trash can take, 
uh, it would be really hazardous for both our air and water. So I have in my hand here, and, and your listeners can't see this, but I have a four pound lead weight. Uh, this is how much lead is in the average uh, medium sized cathode ray tube television. I have it about an inch above the table, and uh, it's about the size of a billfold. So uh, maybe your listeners heard that, but that's how much sure lead. <laughs> so that's how much lead is in a typical television set. But then you say, what about a flat panel? Well, the flat panel backlight is a usually a fluorescent light, uh, high intensity fluorescent light. So there's a lot of mercury in those. Mm -hmm. um, aside from the other precious metals and um, contaminants, uh, all circuit boards are a tin lead solder. The silver stuff you see on a circuit board, that's all lead too. So that has to be recycled. Now, one of the major differences between the Washington County Environmental Center and TechDump is that one of them is uh, a government-run facility and the other is a private business. So the major difference there for us as uh, as customers is that um, the Washington County Environmental Center, uh, everything that they take, um, they will take for free, whether it's, uh, you know, electronics or they also do all kinds of household hazardous waste, anything that can't go in the trash, you know, they accept. Uh, Tech Dump is a little bit more specialized and their pricing tiers are also a little bit different. Uh, so they take things like computers and most of the peripherals for computers. Uh, those are all free, but uh, other items such as like printers um, and various sizes of TVs and uh, gaming systems, um, household appliances and stuff, those have various different uh, prices that it costs to, to take to Tech Dump. Um, so for me personally, uh, I will definitely be uh, taking anything that Tech Dump takes for free down to them because they are much, much closer to my house than, uh, than the Washington County Environmental Center. Um, but uh, yeah, for, for you, you, you'll have to figure out what's worth, uh, what's worth taking to which place. And if you live outside of the Twin Cities, man, I can't help you. Figure out yourself <laughs> what, uh, what solutions there are for recycling electronics in your area. Uh, for Tech Dump, we make our money on the upfront fees that we charge. The sale of commodities, which in computers, the reason we can offer them for free is that we can still make some money off of the circuit boards and steal inside of them. Um, but the piece that people don't always know about us at Tech Dump is that we also sell refurbished computers. Mm -hmm. And so our ability to sell refurbished electronics, which we do under the name Tech Discounts, the reason that we do that is because it really creates um, the maximum kind of environmental value. The less materials that we're mining and having to extract and create um, the better for the environment. And then the great part for our community is they can access really affordable technology. So a laptop for $150 that comes with our one year warranty is a pretty good deal, uh, even compared to some of the Black Friday deals that I'm sure people will be checking out soon um, because it's typically an enterprise grade system uh. because of us recycling for mostly businesses. Um, so it's a great piece, and that's a really important part of how we pay how we pay our bills. The Washington County Environmental Center also has uh, a free room where, you know, since they accept all kinds of different household waste, um, they're able to take some of the stuff that uh, that doesn't necessarily need to be sent off to some other facility for disposal, um, but they, they may be able to process a few things there in-house and, uh, and then put them out in a room uh, for few people to take for free. So most of what I saw in that room was, uh, you know, various types of paint um, that, you know, people just ended up with half a gallon of it left or whatever, and uh, so they brought it down to the environmental center, and uh, and then they can, um, you know, mix together all these different paints that are kind of the same color and uh, and put those out for people to take and use for free. Um, okay, so let's say that somebody brings a laptop to the facility, which I yeah. did, and we dropped it oh, off. Oh, excellent. Yep. <laughs> um, shout out to my brother for leaving all of his broken laptops in my house, so I have materials. <laughs> to bring we are them. also very grateful to him, yes. <laughs> um, so, like, what, what process does it go through? Yeah, so our team, um, so the drop-off process would be the laptops came in, 
Um, the person in the door would not have charged you for any of those laptops because computers are free for drop off. And then they go into our sorting process. And our sorters are trained to decide what has the potential for reuse and what is just too old. So let's say one of those laptops had a great like Windows 95 sticker on it. It will only be recycled. Right. Um, we'll pull some components out of it for um, recycling and then the, the sort of like carcass, if you want to call it that, of the laptop will go actually downstream to a vetted vendor who holds the same certifications, safety practices, environmental standards as us, but has multi-million dollar pieces of equipment and very fancy things that we don't mm -hmm. yet have in our startup life. Um, and so that's where sort of the recycling path goes. Well, laptops are one of the things that would get reused. Now, this laptop you showed me is damaged, mm -hmm. so it wouldn't be reused, but it would, or refurbished, but it, uh, the components would be reused. Uh, first thing that they would do is they would take this laptop um, and they would take the, the hard drive out and they would uh, determine if they could refurbish that or reuse that. And if they do, they, they wipe all the data from it um, and it's reused. Um, even on a hard drive on a, on a tablet like this laptop, um, there's probably several wafers on that hard drive. And if the hard drive itself can't be reused, the wafers can be. Um, okay. So they'll, they'll wipe the hard drive, take one of the five wafers out of it, um, and reuse that. Um, this Samsung Chromebook that you've shown me here will have a motherboard in it, mm -hmm. and it has many, many chips on it. It mm -hmm. has the memory chips. It has a processor chip. So what they will do actually do is they put the chip on a, on a warming board, and it melts the solder, and they're able to remove all the little oh. chips from that board. And then they sort those out, and then that's the big hardware-style uh, store, hardware store things. It's, it might be 16 feet long, 8 feet high, just for all the little chips that they get, and they put them in there like that. And then they sell those. If it's a newer system, which perhaps it was, um, our sorters will say, hey, this has reuse potential. And then it enters into our reuse technician space to our laptops. And they will go through our process of removing the hard drive, wiping it. Um, they'll grab a hard drive that's already been wiped to replace it. And then going through our very thorough testing process, because you can't offer one year warranty if you aren't going through a very right. thorough process. And um, let's say that your wonderful brother really loved Cheetos and he ate Cheetos every day while working and um, that keyboard is just disgusting. And so our team would f swap out the laptop keyboard. Oftentimes it's a laptop screen that's gotten cracked. Our team will swap out for working systems. And so this is part of why we've been involved with some legislation called the right to repair. Yeah. And um, the need to actually be able to source more similarly to independent car repair these parts because right now we're literally harvesting um, like Frankensteining pieces from all these computers that have come in so that we can like piece together just the right components to have the right pieces for this laptop. Mm -hmm. Then testing is complete, data has been wiped, everything's good to go. It'll go up on our e-commerce store of techdiscounts.org. Um, maybe it'll go on our brick and mortar store. It could go up on our eBay store, but less likely. Um, in some cases, we have small businesses and nonprofits and, and private schools coming in and buying like 30 systems at a time. It could be part of that mix. There's mm -hmm. a variety of places that it goes. So what about, are, are there any parts that can't be reused in that, repurposed in that way? What happens then next is um, this, all the components taken out part of this, this whole thing would be shredded including what's left of the circuit board. Mm -hmm. And then it's down to um, pieces smaller than a dime. And then it goes, all the different components are either, there's an optical sorter and it'll push it away from, push it out through air like you've maybe seen in recycling centers. But then the, the, the special thing about uh, dynamic recycling that they do is they have eddy currents. And an eddy current can separate different kinds of metal. So all the copper in here, pieces of dime, size of dimes are smaller, all the aluminum, all the lead, all the silver, all the gold, all the palladium, all get sorted out into different recycling streams. And then it's not recycling anymore because all those things are precious metal and it's just processing the precious metal. So you get the gold, you get the copper, you get the aluminum, uh, the palladium even out of there. Dynamic recycling claims a 100% recycling goal um, if you count waste of energy. Some of the stuff is burned. Some of the, the, the wood is burned from the console TVs, some computer cabinets, um, or the especially the on the older... CRT monitors, some of the plastic is weird plastic that they don't use anymore, and that can't be recycled, but that gets ground up and burned for energy recovery. How about things like uh, printer cartridges? Is that covered? We, we accept printer cartridges here, and, and it's, it's covered. 
uh, on what we take. But we do encourage you uh, to kind of upcycle those and bring those back to where you buy them and you get a credit at more mm-hmm. stores for that. Um, the other piece that I think um, doesn't get talked about nearly enough is around data security, though. Um, so, like, the things that keep me up at night, um, lithium battery fires, mm-hmm. <laughs> which are a whole different um, risk. Um, there's, like, TVs and mercury and all – or, sorry, lead and mercury and all those pieces. And then there's the role of data. And there's a lot of businesses in town that even will work with uncertified electronics recyclers that I think, like, how do you know for sure that your data is – being securely processed. Like there's just sort of this comfort level that we've gained with our electronics. And it really, it spooks me. Clearly different than like a health hazard. Health hazard and data, like not on the same length, but um, Mm -hmm. I think we've talked for a really long time about the environmental risk of electronics recycling. We haven't necessarily talked about the data risk. Right, right. Or people have seen data breaches and assume like there's no right way to recycle, so I won't even try. Yeah, yeah. Someone told me that they were convinced that it was better to put their old cell phone in the trash than recycle it because of data security, which made me like puzzled for hours um, and also then felt the need to explain like lithium battery fires. But like humans have wild ideas mm-hmm. about electronics, and we also get really emotionally connected to our electronics. Yeah. But even think about like a smart TV. Mm-hmm. What used to just be a TV that you could like sell on a garage sale, now your smart TV, if you sold it on a garage sale, probably has your Amazon login mm-hmm. because of Prime and your Netflix. Like there's, there's personal information that's tied in as we move towards this Internet of Things that. Right we all need to be a little bit more aware of and not just um, pass out our (laughs) information to everyone. Granted, I should also disclose that I'm like the person that has the camera on my laptop covered, (laughs) right? Like, so maybe I'm more paranoid than the the average person, but I think... You're not wearing your tin hat right now. No, (laughs) perfect. (laughs) Um, But I think there's a piece of we've gotten so used to giving up our information um, that we need to be a little bit more um, concerned about who we're doing our electronics recycling with. Well, we, we have a, a security pro- process here at the Environmental Center where we take your, your laptop or your hard drive or your, or your computer and anything with a memory is immediately put on our, uh, in our secure area and locked um, and with no access. And then it's shipped to uh, our, our recycling company where it's, uh, we get a receipt for it's sealed uh, locked and sealed, so we know that people aren't tampered, tampering with it on the way. And then they um, will right away log it in uh, into a secure area, and everything's in a secure area until the, the hard drives are wiped off. And so they, they wipe a hard drive to the Department of Defense standards, and they only wipe the ones that they're going to they're gonna repurpose or reuse. The ones that are going to be processed, they go right to the shredder. Okay. So uh, we just ask that you don't have to worry about your data and um, if you're really into recycling and reuse, don't damage it. A lot of people will bring a hard drive with a hole drilled in it or, you know, hit it a couple times with a hammer or whatever just because they, they're worried about their data. So you can w- delete all your data at home, but for sure anything left on there is going to be, uh, I think they read and write, overwrite the data uh, seven to ten times. I invite everyone to recycle earlier. So there's this strange sort of emotional connection we have with our electronics that either... We have a really hard time getting rid of something, and so we hang on to it forever, even though we're not using it, and there's no need to have it. Or there's like the shame that we bought something that we didn't use. And so then we just hang on to it, just in case, anyway. But if we could all recycle our stuff earlier, at the point that you stop using it, which I should put the caveat on, you should use it as long as possible, repair it, give it to somebody else for them to use it for a while, and have them repair it for a while, like use it as long as possible. But at the point that it's no longer in use, um, by getting it to a recycler earlier and has a higher chance of use. So let's say that you still have like an iPhone 8 in a drawer and it's your backup phone that you know that you would never actually use it anyway. You would probably just go buy the 11 if you're a new technology buyer. I am not, but there are those that are. Um, rather than just so leaving the Somebody 8 has in, to be. Yeah, yeah <laughs> clearly, statistically speaking, somebody listening now is buying brand new phones. Um, so let's say you left the iPhone 8 in your drawer for the next three years. Had you gotten rid of it at the point that you were no longer using it, it could have been refurbished and reentered to the market. Someone could use it. 
And it's not just environmental, it's getting people access to affordable technology. And so there's so much good that can be done with our electronics. If we just get over either like the emotional connection or the shame piece of like, I don't want to get rid of this stuff yet. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think the other piece that I would mention that makes Tech Dump very different than some other electronics recyclers or even municipal programs or Best Buy's electronics recycling option is that we are using all of um, sort of the stuff that comes in as both the funding method and the training laboratory for adults facing some sort of barrier to employment. And so we have this great double mission around um, sort of proving that everyone and everything has value, that both um, individuals coming out of incarceration or in recovery from addiction have a role to play within all organizations, as well as the stuff that seems like junk, e-junk, that there's a lot of valuable materials. And so I do think that there's sort of this really compelling um, double mission that people can select to use Tech Dump and accomplish. That's a really beautiful way of putting that. Thank you. (laughs) We think it's pretty cool. Yeah. 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 So I found out about Tech Dump through the Robot Fashion Show. Awesome. Um, Is there any other like, you know, fun community things that, that people should know about that are related to Tech Dump? So this is the first uh, news piece I've done at all about our first ever fundraiser event. Okay. It is a little quirky, as is all all of Tech Dump's way of doing things. Um, so the name of the event is Thank You For Not Coming, the Ultimate Zero Waste Gala. So we are literally inviting people to not come to an event, but to like make sure no one's experiencing deep FOMO, fear of missing out, we will be sending them a link to a video where Tane Danger of Theater of Public Policy will host and MC an entirely empty event space as we share about our mission and our desire to truly accomplish zero waste. And it's embracing the fact that one, fundraisers and galas are super wasteful, and also that we're all just sort of like evented out, that we don't want to have to go to anything no more silent auctions, no more live auctions, no more schmoozing, no more like all the things that kind of just sound exhausting, right? And um, and so we're just sort of embracing the quirkiness of who we are. And um, so we'll see how it goes. So um, people can find us on anywhere on social media for Tech Dump um, with a link to our event break, which is how they will RSVP and pay to attend our event. And then the day of the event on November 12th, at 6 p.m. They'll get a link to a video that I guarantee will be pretty hilarious. Nice. As part of it, we're inviting people to like share on social media what they're not, what they're doing because they're not at the event. (laughs) So I'm super interested to see what that's like. Um, But I think there's, um, there's a lot of ways that sort of we have to push the question on a lot of assumptions. So whether that's that nonprofits always have fancy galas, that that's the only way to raise money, whether it's that these electronics don't have value, whether it's that there's a group of amazing employees that are frequently excluded from employment opportunities, like this is sort of just yet another way that Tech Dump's pushing the pushing the question at least mm-hmm. of like, is this really serving us anymore? Is right. it time to shake it up? I also got to take a tour of both uh, the Washington County Environmental Center and Tech Dump. Um, The Washington County Center is a pretty small facility because um, they aren't doing any processing of any of the materials. They are just uh, packaging things up into, you know, they sort uh, sort different categories of of items and then uh, package them up and ship them off to a uh, a recycling facility. Um, But Tech Dump uh, has has uh, quite a large warehouse where they do a lot of sorting and a lot of uh, processing. And uh, I got to take a tour of that, which was pretty cool. My name is Haley Walters. I worked here for two and a half years now. I'm the office and community outreach coordinator. Uh, This is our, we're in our new facility. We've been here for nine months now. Oh, wow. Yeah. So as as I was mentioning before, kind of we get our two different, two different ways we get electronics, business and residential. We just dropped off your laptop Mm -hmm. in the residential kind of section. Um, And then as things come in, they get pushed through this 
kind of the middle of our warehouse. We're in the sorting area. This team is determining what um, can get refurbished, mm -hmm. what gets sent off to a downstream certified vendor to be recycled, or what gets taken apart in-house. So we always aim to refurbish our electronics before we recycle them. Um, as you can see, uh, we have a pallet of microwaves. Uh, microwaves are one thing that we don't take apart okay. um, in-house. They get sent, sent off to our microwave vendor and they will continue the process of taking apart the microwaves in an in environmentally friendly way, um, break it down to the component level. Uh, we sell our refurbished electronics on a couple different platforms uh, through eBay, on our own e-commerce page on mm -hmm. our website, techdiscounts.org, or um, in our retail store. We have one located in Golden Valley, and then another one we will be opening this winter. Okay. Yeah. Is that over here in the St. Paul side? Yeah, or? it will be in this facility. Okay, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I love I love the monitor testing station because it looks like when you walk into you know Target and they've got all the TVs that are displaying the same image. Yeah. Yeah. No, Ru Russ picked out that image specially. Ru Russ does our does all the monitor testing, mm -hmm. um, and he picked out that you know picture specially just to you know, yeah. soothe the soul. It's got some nice blue. Yeah. The ocean. Yeah. So. We're currently in the teardown area of our facility. These are all the electronics that come through here are electronics that have some sort of precious metal or that at, that would have some value to us on the component side of things. So okay. as you see here, my guys are tearing apart all the different electronics to the circuit boards, the copper, the cord, the metal, uh, and now we have Gaylords full of, of circuit boards. We encourage people to bring in all their electronics, but really if you, if you just updated your smartphone or if you just got a new laptop, bring in your old, you know, that, that one step back, like bring it in like as, as fast as you can because that has more of a market value for us now. Um, and it has a higher chance of like being, being re, like yeah. recirculated, yeah. Yeah, totally. This is our hard drive shredding room. Ooh. And so you can... Kind of take a peek yeah, in there. Can, yeah, that's our uh, stationary hard drive shredder, the white, okay. the white thing. Uh -huh. Hard drives get thrown on the top and then... And then this <laughs> so it's like a it's like a wood chipper. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. Wow, I wouldn't have even like if you hadn't told me these are old hard drives, I would not have recognized them. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Extra Dimension. I am your host Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck, and you can find all of our guests online as well. You can find their information in the show notes for this episode, which again are at thenexus.tv slash TED47. This episode of The Extra Dimension is released under a Creative Commons attribution license, so feel free to use any part of it or all of it as you see fit, as long as you link back to the original page, which once again is thenexus.tv slash TED47. If you would like to discuss this episode with other listeners, please go to our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV. And if you are willing and able to support us financially as we continue to make technology-focused podcasts, you can join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Next month on The Extra Dimension, we will be chatting about human-centered design in software. So if you want to come back for that, uh, be sure to subscribe to The Extra Dimension in your favorite podcast player. And if you have a topic that you think would be cool for us to cover on this show, uh, reach out and let me know. And now, just because it was so cool, I'll leave you with some ambient sounds from the Tech Dump Warehouse. Until next time, have a good one. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence.